All right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming on out. Really uh, appreciated uh, Frank's message this morning. I'm sure most of you guys over here enjoyed it as well. I kind of went through a, a discussion of uh, the Bible and some inspiration issues, an understanding of, of today's society of, uh, you know, absolute truth is, is not popular. So to say that you know something, people say, well, good, I'm glad you know it. Don't tell me that I have to know it. Don't tell me that it's truth. They just want to live in a postmodern, subjective, kind of relativistic type of society. And so I really enjoyed that. Well, today we're going to go over, you know, a, a plan of God's power to establish you. And this is, this is really cool. I was actually going through it for, uh, the other day, actually while I was waiting for little Noah to be born. So I've been, uh, we've been eagerly anticipating the birth of our child. Almost didn't make it to the hospital for those that didn't hear the story. We ended up waiting until... Uh, about 12 o'clock to go into the hospital, and we got there about 12.30, I think, and she had the baby by 1.30. So, uh, I almost delivered a baby, added that to the things that I've done. That would have been pretty scary. Uh, I was definitely nervous about that, but she kept, as we're driving to the hospital, she looked over and she says, I got to push. And I'm like, I thought she was joking. I'm like, oh, that's funny. She's like, no, I got to push. And I'm like, hold it in. <laughs> and so... We get to the hospital, and it's funny. It's funny because the ladies were just very, uh, just nonchalantly, kind of just like, "Oh, no big deal," you know. I'm like, uh, "She's got a push," and they're like, "What?" I'm like, "She says she's got a push," and I think that they just didn't really get the concept of what was going on. So when we brought her in, uh, they sit her down. The first nurse checks her out. She's like, "I need to go get the charge nurse." So she brings the charge nurse in. Charge nurse checks her out and says, "You're 100%. Your water just broke, and the baby's coming." So at that point in time, I'm like, I was freaking out. I, I, there's no other way to say it. I was so nervous. I was just dancing around the whole time. I'm trying to, to keep things going, and it was just, it was pretty insane. Very, uh, I can't really describe the whole entire, uh, everything that just happened was uh, amazing. And it pushed, it really re, uh, reaffirmed how much God is uh, around us. You know, you look at the birth of a child, and you wonder how in the world could anybody ever say, that this isn't from God, you know? How do you look at that and say that this, that this is just an accident, that this just, oh, oh, there's a baby, it can, you know, it wasn't breathing air a couple seconds ago, but now it is. You know, that's just the whole thing. It just, it was, it was pretty moving, very exciting, and I'm glad the baby's healthy. Uh, Jamie will probably be here, you know, in the next couple weeks. We're just kind of getting him getting him custom to everything and uh you know jamie's jamie's not liking uh being home but uh she will be here as soon as she possibly can so the other week i don't know if you guys have been going to our youtube channel we are posting the videos on youtube and the audio so please go to the youtube channel it's www.youtube.com and it's a forward slash that's the one that points from the bottom left to the top right and it's suncoast bible fl so Pastor Russ, as I've been going over uh, in the last couple weeks, he went over the fast track to understanding your Bible. And if you missed that, please go on to the YouTube channel. Uh, you know, learning your Bible is very important, and there's many reasons. And one of the most important reasons is that you can be established. And so we're going to look at that term today, established, and how God establishes you. He's got a threefold plan to establish you, and he wants you to do it in this particular order. He doesn't want you to try to do it down here first, then go to the middle, then go to the top. It won't work that way. And it's a calculated plan, and as we always do, God's word is written in a way in which it can be understood. It's not a big book of just a bunch of stories. No, it's a book that can be understood, that has direct application to us today. So this word established, it can refer to this, a period in time or a moment in which while something is being built or something's being created or fashioned, it reaches a point of stability. It's stable. It's firm. For example, a business can be established when? Well, it can be established on a particular day after the business has done what? Gone through all the formalities, all those legal and technical formalities, filed all the right paperwork. When they get all of that done, the division of corporation says puts a stamp on there and says, you're a business now. You're established. And then you can go out and do a lot of things being established. Established can also mean a point in time in which somebody or something becomes accepted. Think about that for a moment, accepted. You've heard it stated, he's a very established lawyer in the field. 
the doctor's researched is very established. What is, what is it meaning? It's very accepted. As what? As truth. So it's very established. It's very accepted. So either something reaches a point in time, while it's being created, while it's being fashioned, that it's stable, that it's firm, or it becomes accepted. And the text that we'll begin with is Romans chapter number 16. So go and turn to Romans chapter number 16. And we'll look at verses number 25 and 26 to begin. This will be the text that we'll begin with, but we will kind of go over several verses that correlate with this threefold approach. You know, I was going to sleep the other night, and uh, this was probably a week, maybe a week and a half ago, and I was thinking about the baby, and I really just could not fall asleep. I really, I was having trouble, I'm thinking about everything I have to get done, and this verse popped in my head. And I never sat there, and like we've said many times, Pastor Russ and I joke around, we don't sit there and, and spend time memorizing Bible verses. I don't actually sit down and, and have like memory sheet cards and start memorizing the verses. They come as you just read them. And I, I kept reading this now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. And the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. And as I read through this, I started, I started going, okay, i, I got to break this down for a second. I really want to break this verse down because I think there's something more I need to get out of this. So I, I lean over, I grab my iPhone, similar to this lady in the front, and I, I grab my iPhone and I start looking at the verses on my phone. And I'm reading, I'm going, I'm going up a couple verses and I'm reading through. And I'm reading through Paul's you know, salutations here in the very end of this epistle, in the very end of his letter, the longest letter that he writes. And I realized a couple things about this passage. These two verses, as I read them and began to really focus on what is written, it became obvious that this text is, is really critically important to an understanding of how you get established. And it's an understanding of how and to what you become established, too, as well. And God, through the Holy Spirit, working through Paul and what we talked about, that word inspiration today, wrote down this little plan. And he writes it at the very end of the book, but it's throughout the entire book of Romans. So before we open up with Romans chapter 16, verse 25, let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to gather together, to read your word, to study it, to grow in understanding, and that today we may understand more about your power and the power that is to establish us in your threefold approach, and that we'll take this to heart, Lord, and that we will apply it in the way that you have told us to apply it. We thank you for salvation, so rich, so free, and the grace that's in our lives every day in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So Romans chapter number 16, verse 25, let's read it. It says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. One, two, that's a, that's a punch, that's a pack of information that we've got to dissect. We've got to really break it down and see what he's talking about here. So he ends this book of Romans with several salutations. And he's closing you out on the book of Romans. If you've never sat down and read the book of Romans from start to finish, do it this week. Do it this week. It'll take you about an hour. Just do it. Just sit down. You won't understand all of it, I'm sure, but just go through. And just. And if there's things you don't understand, just put a little, put a little pencil mark by it. Like, I'll come back to that. Don't get hung up on words. Just get through the whole book. Because you remember, Paul's writing you a letter. And when you get a letter from a friend, what are you going to do? You're going to read the whole thing. You're not going to skip parts of it. Like, oh, I'll save that for tomorrow. No, you're going to read the whole thing. You're going to read it all in one sitting. So I encourage you, if you haven't done that, do it. But this book is the most important. It's the most detailed and comprehensive doctrinal book that we really have today. Paul's longest epistle, as I said. And in this last closing salutation, he makes a very profound statement on how God's going to establish you and how he does it through his power to establish you. The very first thing, it begins with my gospel. That word my there is, 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 is unique. It's saying it's my gospel. 
It's Paul's gospel. It's possessive of him, right? That pronoun mine. And then it goes to the second thing, the preaching of Jesus Christ. But what you have to do is you have to read this, and look what it says here. You could take it like this and say, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Okay. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery. That according to means by way of. Right? So you see what he's doing here. He's, he's just breaking it up. He's giving you almost a list of things. So you have to come back and give it to you. What kind of sometimes is, is problematic is there's, there's those explanatory you know, parentheticals. Right? Where, where he'll make a comma and then he gives you the little explanation of what he's talking about, then another comma. And that can kind of get confusing. And, and what I do to help myself out in that is I read it out loud. I'll sit there and my wife's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, just reading the Bible. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get it how Paul is doing it. You know, because as he's, as he's, he actually is, Paul is reciting this to Tertius. And he, Tertius actually wrote it. And Paul is actually up there talking about it, right? And so he's speaking it out. And so you can see that as he's doing it, the way, he's, the way he goes back and forth. You know, what shall we say then? You know, he's, he's really in it. And that's God obviously working through him by inspiration to write down these words on the page for us then to read. So you have to look at it. Now to him is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to what? The scriptures of the prophets. Right? So these three things, my gospel, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and the scriptures of the prophets are all what? Essential to you, or you being established. So you have to have all three of these. You can get my gospel. That's the place we're going to begin today. Then you're going to get the preaching of Jesus Christ in a particular way. You're going to preach him with an understanding that's not just the understanding that the prophets had, but that's the understanding of, of the revelation of the mystery. And then ultimately you're going to look at the scriptures of the prophets. If you started down here at the scriptures of the prophets, you wouldn't have a very good time. You wouldn't really understand what's going on. You go back there and, and you try to do some things back here in this program, which we'll look at the chart here on the left-hand side, and you may go, ah, oh, it doesn't really make any sense. How does that really work? Or you may take a piece of the prophecy, try to apply it to you today, and then you'd really be in trouble because God can't establish you to that because that prophecy wasn't given about you or to you. So we understand that all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable. We have to look at which parts are the most profitable for us today. And, of course, it begins with none other than Paul's my gospel. So, first, we must understand that being established, understand this, that it is that any of these, if it's in, the, if it's in Paul's my gospel, if it's in the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, or if it's in the scriptures of the prophets, he establishes you by his power. Okay? That needs to be very clear. You don't have to go, get, go to seminary and go get a degree to understand your Bible. Everybody in this room can understand this book. And so what I'm doing today is I'm preaching. Some will call it foolish. We'll look at some verses about that. But it's really important that we do listen to preaching. And we look at the Word of God, and we do as, as, Paul, as uh, uh, Frank was talking about today in Acts 17. And, and you look at the Scriptures, and you search them, Right? And you see if such things are so. As Russ has always said, hey, don't take it from me. Search the scriptures and see. If at any point in time you have a question about this thing afterwards, we'll hang around. And trust me, I would stay here all day talking to any one of you about God's word. No problem. We'll go grab lunch. We'll come back. We'll have another sermon. We can keep doing it. We'll do it all day. So this, this, this issue here of, of now to him that is of power, it's God. That him refers to God. As verse 27 states, to God only wise... Be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So God is of power to establish you, and he's also able to establish everyone else in the world, first and foremost, in what way? Well, read it. My gospel. A place where everyone must begin before they can have anything to do with God. Before you can please God, before you can say, I have a relationship with God, before you can actually even pray, you have to understand Paul's my gospel. Paul calls it my gospel, for it was given to him. And it was given to him to us. And there's no other message today that can begin but there. And I think most of us today understand that it's God's will that, that all men understand this gospel. And inside this gospel is, is, is the message of salvation, which we will discuss. And this salvation is threefold, not only from the penalty of sin, but ultimately from the power. And you understand that as you get these. And then it's ultimately from the presence of sin when we go to be with the Lord. So this, this power of God is the power which saves. It's God's power that was demonstrated through the gospel and in what his son, Jesus Christ, did for us. 
us in our unregenerate, in our dead in trespasses and sin state, he did what? He died for us. Delivered for your offenses, raised again for your justification, and he alone is the only one that's of power to establish you. That's hard for some people. They don't like to hear that. They want to go, oh, well, I want to be of power to establish myself. Right? I want to, I want to, I want to go to med school. I want to go to law school. I want to be prestigious. I want to be a congressman, a senator. I'm a power to do that, right? Let's get, let's empower. It's funny the lady that was having that was talking to us about the uh, giving birth. She kept saying that uh, Jim, you're a very empowered woman. And I went, I said it more than one, more than ways more ways than you know. She's empowered. And and the power that you think that she had. I mean, Jamie gave birth 100% naturally. Didn't didn't get an IV. Didn't get a drug. And she'll tell you. She says, it wasn't that bad. She says, it wasn't that bad. And, uh, you know, I kept, I looked at her several times th- throughout the process, and I was like, you okay? And she says, I'm good. And we knew all along, when we, we went to the, uh, the birthing class, people had all these little things. How are we going to get through this? How are we going to get through birthing? People had bouncy balls that they sat on and they bounced on. I don't know, like birthing balls. I, was, I don't know what that is, but okay. They had one lady that said, well, we, we, get in the, we, we actually stand on our heads. What well, helps, like, the baby wants to move top then, and you're like, I don't know. These people had all kinds of crazy ideas. And uh, they said, write down on your card how you're going to get through your pregnancy. And you know what I wrote on there? I wrote on there, Jesus Christ. And I showed it to Jamie, and she goes, yep. It's an understanding. It's a knowledge. It's a thought process. It's who you have inside of you that enables you to do what? It enables you to do anything. You're like, I, I can do everything. It doesn't really matter. You start realizing that this life and what it's all about it is not what most people think. We're going to look at some verses today in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where Paul says that all things are become new. Everything. So the way you look at things, totally different. That's why some people say, Jason, you're crazy. Fair enough. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 and you'll realize why they would say that. Because the preaching of the cross to them which perish is foolishness. But to us which are saved, it is the power of God. And that's the gospel. That's where it begins right there. Paul's my gospel. So how much power does a dead man have? If you're dead in sins, dead in trespasses, how much power do you have? None. You can't lift anything. So if you're looking at this threefold approach, my gospel, you go, okay, great. I, I, we're at the end of the book, though. Where, where, do we, where do we begin? If we have to first know and believe what Paul's my gospel is, well, where would you look? Well, I think that the most obvious place to look would be, let's start at the beginning of his letter. Maybe perhaps in the beginning of his letter he would shed some light on, on this. Well, let's, let's turn there. Romans chapter number 1. And remembering that these are letters, it's always a good place to start. If you don't get something in the middle of it, turn to the beginning of it and then read to the end and pr- pr- probably your, your question would be answered. Romans chapter number 1, Paul starts this book by, by stating that he is ready to preach the gospel. He says, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are Rome also. So if he starts off the, the book, his epistle, his letter, by stating he's ready, and not only ready, but that he owes it to you, and that as much as in him is, he's going to preach it to you. Is it probably a good place to start? Yeah, it's a great place to start. You look at the, at the gospel issue. Let's start in Romans chapter number 1. So look at, look at uh, 15 here. Well, we'll start at verse number 14. Paul says the following. Paul says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul starts in Romans chapter 1, in verse 14 he says he's a debtor, right? What does that mean? If you don't pay your credit card bill, what happens? You become a debtor to the credit card company. And if you don't pay your mortgage, what happens? You become even in more debt than you were before. And they may foreclose on you. So Paul's in, a, in an indebted relationship to the Gentiles. As an apostle of the Gentiles, as we know, underneath the dispensation of the grace of God, that he's the apostle of the Gentiles, what does he need to do? He's got to get this out to everybody, all the Gentiles. So in, in verse number 14, he talks about the Greeks and the barbarians. He talks about the Greeks, who are the, the smart guys, 
and he talks to the barbarians. Those are the not-so-smart guys. That's why he calls them the unwise. And he says, so as much as in me is, what's really in Paul working in him? Holy Spirit. Christ. He's ready to preach the gospel. Same gospel we're going to talk about here in the end. Romans chapter number 16. The first one you've got to understand. And here's what Paul says about the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And he says, for it is the power of God. Remember we talked about a little bit, bit ago that it's God's power to establish you? Well, where is he going to start with to establish you? He's going to start with what? The gospel. And what do you need? You need God's power to establish you to the gospel. Because you and your dead in sins and dead in trespasses state, um, not going to get very far in trying to establish yourself according to the gospel. You have to do it in a specific way. And the specific way that Paul says here is the following. He says, for it is the power of God, the gospel is, unto what? Unto salvation. And here's the next thing. Who is it available to? Like I said before, everyone. To everyone that does what? Believes. What's the only thing you can do without doing anything at all? Believe me. Trust me. Right? It's like that old, uh, uh, my mom uses this example consistently about this guy named Charles Blondin who walks across the Niagara Falls. Have you ever heard of this story? Charles Blondin, guy walks across Niagara Falls on a tightrope, right? Walks across Niagara Falls, and he first he starts and says, how many people think I can walk across Niagara Falls on a tightrope? People are like, yeah, I think you can do it, maybe. Some people are like, no, nah, you're going to die. He goes and crosses Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Then he comes back over, and he gets a wheelbarrow. He says, how many people think I can walk Niagara Falls with this wheelbarrow? And people are like, yeah, that's kind of scary. Walks across Niagara Falls with the wheelbarrow, comes back, and he goes, all right, all right. How many think I can walk across this with the wheelbarrow again? The guy's like, oh, I think so, I think so. He's like, all right, get in it. And he's like, whoa, I'm not getting in the wheelbarrow. You're crazy. You're crazy, I'm not getting in that thing, right? You just saw him do it. You know he can do it. Now, when, when if, if that guy were to get in, eventually he does get in. A guy actually gets in and walks across, comes back. You can see it. It's actually in. We went to Niagara Falls just to go see this, could you not? And uh, there's a little picture of him. My brother's laughing over there because this is a great family trip that we did out to Niagara Falls to go see Charles Blondin's rope and, the, and him in a wheelbarrow crossing, crossing the thing. But, you know, while he's in there, what if the guy was like, oh, let me help out just a little bit. Let me help out. No, he can't do anything. He's not a power to help him in any way, shape, or form. What's he going to do? Shh, sit still and be quiet. And when you study the scriptures of the prophets and you start looking at the Old Testament and you look at things like the Day of Atonement where they say you don't do a single thing, you don't lift a finger, what's it, what's it referring back to? How God's in power to save you. That's what's going back to. So this stuff can establish you, which we'll look out here later, and what the purpose of the prophets are for today. But you have to get this gospel issue. So it's the power of God of salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. I want, to, I want to explain that for a second. A lot of people go, what is that all about? I understand this. The Jew first, also to the Greek. I don't really get it. Well, in the period of time in which Paul was writing this, this was a transitionary book. So in the book of Acts, we understand that that's from the, the understanding of, uh, of the natural progression of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you read the book of Acts, it's no different than what's happening in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the beginning parts of it. And so this is kind of a little plug for, uh, for our Sunday school. So if you, uh, I've been teaching Sunday school for the last... I want to say probably at least 16, 15 weeks, something like that. could be longer. We've done about 22 weeks uh, in our Bible study that we've been going through the book of Acts. And we're only up to Acts chapter 5, so it won't take you too long to get caught up. But we go through in a pretty detailed uh, orientation here. But many ask about this phrase here. Well, it's in relation to when the book was written. See, from Matthew to mid-Acts, the message's message was to the Jew only. Then from mid-Acts to the end of Acts, it's Jew first, then the Greek. And that's when the book of Romans was written. And then after that point in time, it was Jew and Greek, or Jew and Gentile, without distinction. It didn't matter anymore. So you get that understanding, and people go, God, I understand. What does this mean? How, how are you doing? Well, this is what it is. This is what he's talking about. He's giving you a, a kind of a historical understanding here, right? To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Well, in verse number 17, he uses a phrase that, that this verse here, I've, I, I, I've, I've, obviously I haven't memorized, but it's one of these ones that I would encourage you to memorize it. Because inside the gospel, he says, for therein, what's he talking about? Therein what? Therein inside the gospel, and Paul's my gospel, is what? Is the righteousness of God revealed. At our Bible study the other night, I asked somebody the question. I said, I said guys, where else was God's righteousness revealed? There's really two places in which God's righteousness was revealed. The first was the law. Does the law demonstrate God's righteousness? Absolutely it does. And you may look at it sometimes and say, that's a ridiculous law. 
yeah, some things may seem a little ridiculous. I said, I said, we're talking about the shaving the corners of your beard. You can't shave the corners of your beard. Well, come on. Well, that's what God says. I have no problem with it. The law was not given to me. If you understand the purpose of the law, and the law's purpose is to do what? That all, every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God? That the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? You start to realize what? Oh, yeah, the law does show the righteousness of God. But who else shows the righteousness of God? Christ demonstrates the righteousness of God. And what he does is he fulfills the law. He comes and he says, oh, I keep the law. Thought, word, deed, 100%, keep it. Nobody else can say they did that. So the righteousness of God, which is revealed by the law, was, was kept by Christ, the only other one who exemplifies the righteousness of God. And that's the gospel. Inside there he says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. That's in the gospel issue of Christ and his righteousness, that he is 100% perfect, sinless sacrifice. who died on the cross for your sins. And he says it's revealed from faith to faith. And that faith is, number one, the faith that you that uh, of, of uh, Lord Jesus Christ and being faithful to go to the cross. Paul says he's obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, right? He goes and he, he faithfully does as he says, but it's also the faith of God in that same regard because God is what? God was in Christ, reconciling himself into the world. So when you look at that and you say the faith of faith, is God faithful in what he says and what he does? Absolutely. And that's why you're going to get down, down number three, the scriptures of the prophets. That's what really helps you out. You start to learn about the scriptures of the prophets. You start to learn about how faithful God is and what he says and what he does. And what that does is give you comfort and hope as we'll read later on. But it says, from faith to faith. And that to faith, that issue here is the gospel. You believe by faith, what? That Christ died for your sins. That's it. Died for your sins. Paul says he was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. He likes to put on this little tagline at the end here. I like this because he says, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. When he says, as it is written, he's referring back to something back here. Aeneas, back at 2.4. He's saying the just shall live by faith. So he's giving you some more understanding about how the just man lives in all points and times. And if you were to study this out, it's, it's very important that you get the gospel issue. And I have a correlation with Romans chapter number 1 and Galatians chapter number 3. And I always use this because it's very important. Look at Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 10. This is a great passage of scripture. There's a verse in, uh, I'll just read you the verse in Romans chapter number 2, verse 13. Paul says the following. He says, For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And people say, Catholics use that verse all the time. and say, yep, see, look. Doers of the law are just before God. Well, you have to understand what Paul's doing here in the book of Romans. He's starting off in, in number one. He says, I'm getting ready to declare the gospel to you. And he goes and gives you a little bit about it, that the just shall live by faith. And then in the next verses, what does he do? He railroads you. He puts you in a position that you're like, oh, wow, I am in bad, bad shape. I'm a really sinful person. That's what one, two, and then ultimately three do to you. He says, we conclude once before that all are under sin. It doesn't matter. So when you look at that verse in 2.13, he says that for the hearers of law are, not, are just before God, but the doers of the law are justified. Okay, well, let's look at what he's really talking about here. He's saying no one, no one is. If you read in verse number three, he says, therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. And then you read in Galatians chapter number three, he says, for as many as are under the works of the law are under the curse. You don't want to put yourself under the law. Don't try, to, don't try to do it in your own power. Use God's power. God's power is Christ, and it's inside the gospel, and use that. Don't use your own power to establish you according to the gospel. Do it how he says. He says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written. There's that word again. What's he doing? He's going back. He's giving you something back here. He says, for it's written. What? Cursed is everyone. Every, I'm sorry. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. I always ask people when they talk about the law, can you even name me the Ten Commandments? No. So how could you possibly keep them if you can't name them? And it's not just ten, it's about 700. Statutes, the ordinances, the commandments, they're like, oh wait, there's more than just the commandments? Yeah, there's a lot more. And they don't really realize all those things, but that's because as we're discussing Satan's plan and policy of evil, he's very, he's very particular. He's got wiles, he's got tactics, he's got devices. Those are terms and phrases that Paul uses wiles, tactics, and devices. So look at this here in verse number 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. Got that? No man 
is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, meaning obviously, come on. If you don't continue in all the things of the law to do them, how are you possibly going to get justified by it? It's evident that what? <laughs> the just shall live by faith. Always. People forget that there's a, a good period of time in between uh, Abraham and Moses where, you know, Adam and Moses, really, they, they, didn't have a, they didn't have a law, right? So you go, oh, oh, we're joking around and we're talking about uh, my baby, and they said, uh, is, is uh, Noah going to be circumcised? And I said, uh, I said, is he, uh, oh, with a name like Noah, what do you think? And then I actually thought about it for a second. I'm like, well, actually, Noah's really not a Jew. You know, he's, he's before the law. And so I, I was thinking about that for a little bit here, but that was, that was kind of funny. And then I, we were talking with my buddy, and he said, he, he sent me Romans 2, 26 through 28, and I was like, very funny. You'll look that up later. True circumcision is of the heart, but we'll, we'll digress on that. So anyways, in verse number 11, he says, But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, is, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And look what this statement is in verse 12. You want to get an encapsulating statement? You want something that's just going just to really hammer it home? It's this right here, he says, And the law is not of faith. Because why? Because you're working to do the law by your own power. You have to use God's power to establish you according to the gospel. And that's Paul's, my gospel. So God's a power to establish you, to make you acceptable because of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we understand this message to be unique. It's called Paul's my gospel. The issue here, and I'm sorry, in Galatians 3.12, he says, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Uh, what he's talking about there, he says, yeah, if you're going to be in the law, you can't be just a hearer of the law. You follow me? You have to live in them. You have to live in the commandments. You've got to do them. You can't do it that way. You can't just be like, oh, I like the law. It sounds good. No, no, no. You've got to do the law. That's what he's talking about there. So, Anyways, if God's a power to establish, he makes you acceptable. He does all that. And, and God desires, as does Paul, is for us to take Paul's my gospel. Take this gospel. This is what, listen, folks. God wants you to take, take Paul's my gospel. And he wants you to see it as your gospel. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, he says, the gospel of your salvation, right? It's a very personal thing. He wants Paul's my gospel to be your gospel. So then it ultimately becomes, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, our gospel, right? You, you know when you get married, what happens? They say, what's yours is fine and mine is yours, it's ours, right? And so that's what he wants you to do with the gospel. He wants you to understand that Paul's my gospel is also your gospel. You believe it and it becomes our gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. Second Corinthians chapter number four, in verse number three, he says, "But if our gospel be hid, if we don't tell other people about the good news of Paul's my gospel, what are we doing with it? We're hiding it. We're keeping it to ourselves. The best news ever. You wouldn't want to keep that to yourself. Why? Because there are people, as Paul says, that are lost, and they need to be found." And they're found in only one way, through God's power, to establish them according to the gospel. We talked about that Romans 10, 17, you know. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That faith, the just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It comes from the word of God, which encapsulates the gospel in Romans chapter number 1. Now, you could say to yourself, well, well this Roman, can't, can't we get the gospel anywhere? No, you can't. You can't find it back here. You can't find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You can't find it in Genesis. You can't find it in Exodus. My brother was telling me about a friend of his who they were witnessing to, and he said, uh, um, he said, oh, I've been reading my, I've been reading my Bible. And he goes, oh, yeah? Uh, where'd you start? And he's like, oh, I started in Genesis. How far did you get? He's like, uh, you say numbers? He's like, I'm in numbers. I'm like, Phew. that's pretty good. And, you know, but can you get saved reading Genesis through numbers? No. Because the scriptures of the prophets, that's not where you get established. You need to get established first and foremost on Paul's my gospel issue. So what does God, what does God desire? He wants it to, that my gospel become our gospel, become your gospel, get you saved, right? So, so 
Zane's playing, his kids playing around over here. And these are great books. They're, I, 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 people say, Jason, you, you seem like you're, you're negative against the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, not at all. I love those books. We spend so much time in there in the book of Acts in our Sunday school. We, we've spent more time in there than we probably do in the actual book of Acts because of the natural progression of the kingdom program with, with Christ being the king, right? So this, this power to establish Paul's my gospel, important that you understand that, important where you start and you get going. You know, uh, Paul, Paul calls the gospel, he says, you know, it's, it's the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, and it's by the power of God which saves those by faith who trust and believe it. You know, in the beginning of Romans chapter number one, turn there for a second, Paul says a statement that's pretty, pretty interesting. He writes to both the saved and the unsaved in the book of Romans. He's writing a book that's, you know, saved the unsaved. And of course, he, like anywhere, he starts with the issue of the gospel. But in Romans chapter number one, verse 11, Paul says, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Think about that for a second. You know, while in here he's talking about the mutual faith, he says, I'm pardoned you some spiritual gift. To the end, you may be, what's that word again? Established, right? That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. That's, that's what Paul's my gospel, becoming your gospel, becoming our gospel. So then we have what? The one faith, as, as Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. It's only one faith. You can't have a million different faiths. There's only one. As Paul calls it one Lord, one faith. And so when you read this thing here, this, this uh, of course he's talking about this mutual faith, but the spiritual gift, think about it. Is eternal life a spiritual gift? Yeah. And doesn't it come by way of the gospel? Yeah. It's kind of cool. I was reading through it and I said, yeah, he, that's what he's really doing. He's telling, he's like, I long to see that imparting you some spiritual gift. That is the comforting, you and me, the mutual faith. And that's what it does. We get established in the faith. We understand Paul's my gospel is, and we proceed forward to, you know, the next issue. So, you know, God, God builds us up. He's going to make us accept it. It's all done by the power. And, and we've got to start with the gospel. It's a place we begin. It's a place where he ends. He starts with the book of Romans, uh, with the gospel. He ends with it, says, you want to get established, you've got to do it this way. So once you now believe the gospel, you can then begin to understand what God's doing. You need to do it in the right order. Because if you start looking at the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, you just jump into the book of Ephesians it's going to be like this. For those on the tape, I'm just moving my hands above my head. You know, It's going to fly right over your head. You're not going to get anything. Or what you're going to do is you're just going to quote-unquote spiritualize it. But without the Holy Spirit, you're really fleshlyizing it. If that's not really a term, I made it up. But it's true. It's what you're doing. You're just making it fleshly. And we'll look at that just in a moment. So you believe the gospel. You have to understand that at that point in time when you believe it, the gospel of your salvation, Paul says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Spirit is power from God to do what? To understand God. And how do you understand God? Well, you understand God by understanding his word, and you've got to go to the next blank. That's the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Paul says in Romans chapter number 8 that if you are simply in the flesh, if you don't have the spirit of God, he says, you're none of this. And he goes on further to say, you can't please God. He says, so they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So you've got to get the spirit. You, you see why it's important in the, in the order of the language? Is the order of the language important? Yeah, my gospel. It's important to start there because that's the only place you can get the spirit. You're not going to get the Spirit down here in the Scriptures of the Prophets. Many people like to. I like to go back to Acts chapter 2. I got the Spirit now. Look at me. Pastor Dana, that, that lady, I don't know if you've heard of her. She's down on 34th Street. And she's doing that whole like little tent revival. And it's pretty interesting. They had some uh, one of the pastors from St. Pete, uh, the big church on Gandhi. I forget what that place is called. They went down there, and they had a whole little ruckus. And it's been all over the blogs. And it's, uh, uh, you guys can Google it when you get home. But look at the Pastor Dana and the Pastor Steve, I want to say his name is. Uh, very interesting. Very, it, it was all over CARM, which is that Christian, Christian apologetics research uh, site. They have a whole blog post posting about it, and it's pretty interesting. But they went through it, and she was claiming the, you know, God was going to give people money and just all these, all kinds of very interesting things. But um, I would take a look at that when you, when you get a second. But you know, once you once you believe this gospel, you can start to understand it, and, and obviously you need the Spirit and His Word to 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 go further into the establishment issues. If you look at First uh, Corinthians chapter number one. Paul makes a couple statements here. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. 
First Corinthians chapter number one, verse eighteen, Paul says the following. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to us which are saved is the power of God. Again, we see that word power. It's the power of God. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by what? The foolishness of preaching to save them that what? Believe. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. He was that cornerstone of offense. They didn't want to believe him. And unto the Greeks, it's foolishness. No, come on. You're just telling me i got to believe in this? No, give me something more. Give me, give me something more. I need something more. I always call the Greeks today the, the, the really the reformed, the hardcore reformed guys, all the big Calvinists. They like to have all the big egghead. You know, I want to be super smart. I want to know all this stuff about the Bible. I can tell you all these different things. And what they do is they just, they just destroy themselves by that. Because it's, their, it's their own wisdom. And he says, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, what is the power of God? Christ is the power of God. Because the foolishness of God is what? It's wiser than men. And he says, even the weakness of God is stronger than men. So we're talking about this as being power. Paul lays it in. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't really apologize for what he says. He goes right through it, and he's just going to tell you how it is. He's going to tell you, you like it? Oh, well, sorry. He did it with a gracious spirit, but he's like, this is truth. This is absolute truth. You know, later on, Paul says in 2.5, he says the following. He says that your faith, that faith that, you know, that saves, is your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. That's an issue. You go to seminary, you're going to get a lot of wisdom of men. He says, but in the power of God. And what's the power of God? Well, the gospel. It is. Ultimately, you know, we're going to get to this next issue, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. you got to get the Spirit. And this is not some like hokey pokey mystical thing that I'm I'm asking you to do. That's that's not what it is. What it simply is, it's the indwelling Holy Spirit. He comes to take residence inside of you. As Paul says, it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ will come, he lives inside of you, and he will give you the understanding as you read God's word. Now, do you still need teachers? Do you still need preachers? Absolutely you do. For the edifying of the bodies, we'll read in Ephesians chapter four to close. But you need those things. Yeah, absolutely. You need to have you need to have teachers. You need to have preachers. You need to have the guys that are a little bit further along. Uh, a guy named Chip Ingram. Don't know if you know who he is, but he had a he, he said this. He says, you know, my one of my uh, pastors said, you know, Chip, you need three you need three people. You need three people in your life. That's all you need. He says, besides God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, you need three people on earth. And I said, and he says, what is that? He goes, number one, everybody needs a Barnabas. And like, yeah. Some guy you can come to. You know, Barnabas was, was called the son of consolation. He, he's like, a, he's a confidant. He'll help you out. He'll, he'll be there to pat you on the back, say everything will be okay. Pray with you. Be with you. He says, number two, everybody needs a Paul. Somebody to teach you. Somebody to instruct you. And he goes, but it doesn't stop there. And everybody needs a Timothy. Somebody that you're doing the same thing with. You're building up. You're edifying. You're growing. You're getting them stronger. And if you look at it, 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, none of that's possible without the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 13, Paul says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. The Bible is full of spiritual things. He says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. They require the Holy Spirit in God's word to discern them. He says, but he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? How do we really know what's going on? Look what he says here. Did you know that you have the mind of Christ? You do. Now how are you going to build that up? How are you going to get that established? How are you going to get that edified? Well, we started with my gospel. That was the great place to begin. That's how you got the mind of Christ. Then you began next. We go look at the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And that revelation according to the revelation of the mystery is important. A big distinction that you must see is the difference between Jesus Christ according to the prophets. Okay? Is Jesus Christ prophesied in the Old Testament? Absolutely. But is there a whole new understanding about Jesus Christ 
in accordance to the revelation of the mystery? Yes, there is. Look at Acts chapter number 3. Acts chapter number 3. book of Acts is a great book. Um, I think it's probably my second favorite over the book of Romans, but, or under the book of Romans. And Paul, or, uh, uh, Luke writes here in Acts chapter number 3, verse 20, he says, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. This is Jesus Christ in accordance to prophecy. And he says, Whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So God spoke about a lot of things concerning Jesus Christ in relation to mystery. Not in revelation, I'm sorry, mystery. Relation to prophecy. Not in revelation to the mystery. So this is a big thing you need to see. A difference between the prophetic elements of Christ, which are there throughout the Old Testament, and then the revelation of the mystery. It wasn't until later through Paul that we hear about something called the dispensation of the grace of God. One thing is for certain, though, in order for the scriptures, uh, in order for you to understand the scriptures of the prophets, you know, you have to get the revelation of the mystery. Because you may be thinking that Jesus Christ is this right here, and when, no, we've got to wait a second. That's, that's the prophetic element of Christ. Still to be fulfilled, still going to happen, but you need to get the mystery aspect as well. You know, one of the best passages on Jesus Christ according to Revelation the mystery is really uh, Ephesians chapter number 3. Turn there with me. Ephesians chapter number 3. People ask me, can you define, tell me what the mystery is. Will somebody just tell it to me? Just tell me what the mystery is? Like lay it out like plain and clear? Well, here, here it is for you. Paul's going to tell you about it, but let me just kind of tell you what, what it is. The mystery is not that Christ was going to come. The mystery was not that Christ was going to die for sins. That's in the scriptures of the prophets. But rather, it's the deeper understanding that Christ was going to die for the sins of the whole world, that the Gentiles would have Christ in them, the hope of glory, and that ultimately God, despite Israel, would create a new entity called the body of Christ. That's the mystery. So why is it so important to understand Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? Well, look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter number 3. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. I ask people that all the time. Have you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God? And they look at me and they're like, what? No, I've never heard of it. Paul says it's kind of important to know. He says, this is what he says. He says, how that by revelation he may known unto me the mystery, as I wrote in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may ha understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, when we're talking about positionally in the book, in the Bible, where you're going to go, read that again for a second. He says, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, where did he get this from? He says, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Well, he made it known unto Paul. Did he make it known unto anybody else? Paul's the only one that we have anything about the mystery in God's word about, right? Look what he says here. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Well, if you want to understand Paul's knowledge about, knowledge about the mystery of Christ, you've got to look at Paul's letters, right? The, the books that he wrote. That's where you're going to find it. That's why we're looking at Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. We start in those books. Romans to Philemon. Start there. It'll get you, I'm telling you, it'll just be like a groundwork. I've only been uh, coming to Suncoast now probably about three years. And prior to that, you know, I was, uh, grew up in a community church. And pretty much after that, grew up in a Baptist church. And so uh, I was saved at a young age, May 9th, 1989. But I didn't have the full assurance of understanding as we're going to look at here in Colossians until I acknowledged the mystery. Until you, somebody said, hey, you heard about the mystery? You know what this is? No, nope, not a clue. And many people, I think, can share the similar testimony of, of myself. So in Ephesians chapter 3, he says, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Okay, so think about that just for a second. If it's not made known to the sons of men in other ages, right, 
Well, that'd be the scriptures of old. So you're not going to find the mystery back there. So where are you beginning? You're going to begin with the, apostles, the issues with Paul. Look what he says the following thing here. As is now revealed unto his holy apostles, that is plural, because there are more apostles than the apostle Paul. And he says, and prophets by the Spirit. Before the, the word was completely encapsulated, recorded, completed, the complete word of God, they obviously needed more revelation because why? Paul couldn't be everywhere at one point in time. He's only one man, but he does say that he's finished his course and he you know, evangelized almost the entire known world. But look what it says in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of whose power? His power. Again, it's all about him. Unto me, whom less than the least of all saints, is this, great, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The unsearchable riches means that where else are you going to get it? I'm going to preach you the unsearchable riches of the Gentiles. Go back to Deuteronomy and tell me about the Gentiles. They don't have a very good time. Yeah. Go back to Exodus and read about the Gentiles. Read about Egypt. I mean, just start. Just go through it. You know, they're, they're in a position. Ephesians 2.11 tells you about their position in times past. But, but does it really matter? Does it really matter if we never acknowledge a mystery? Can you go your whole life and not acknowledge a mystery? Yep, a lot of people do. But you know what their understanding is? It's not complete. It's not full. The judgment seat of Christ for those individuals will be not as favorable. And there's good reason. We have to understand that we're kind of without excuse on this issue. God preserved the Bible... And I think we can all agree that, you know, many of us have said, ugh, probably need to read it just a little bit more, myself included. You know, I, don't, I just don't take the time. I watch a little too much American Idol. I watch a little too much Suits. It's a good show. Whatever it might be. Look at Colossians chapter number 2. We're almost done here. Colossians 2. A few more verses. This is what Paul says. Colossians number 2, chapter 2, verse number 1. He says, For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. If you want all treasures of wisdom and knowledge, not the wisdom of men, but the wisdom of God, you must acknowledge the mystery. What does that mean? That is to both accept and to admit the existence of it and the truth of God's divine plan and its paramount importance. Once you grasp the gospel... And then the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation, the mystery, and you fill yourselves with the epistles of Paul first concerning the church, the body of Christ, you are well on your way to being a grown-up man or woman of God. See, it's not that your old man is being made better. Many people say, God's not done working with me yet. He's making me who he wants to be, you know, a little son. Well, technically, not really. He's killed that one. That one's crucified. It's dead. It's sitting in a box, as Russ says. Don't bring him out to play. It stinks. So the new man is Colossians 3.10. He says, your new man is renewed. How? Colossians 3 verse 10, he says, and having put on the new man, not the old one, you're not making the new one better. You're putting on the new one. He gave you the new one. Put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So the scriptures, the prophets, are they beneficial to your establishment? You, oh, you better bet so. It's great. I mean, I, you got to realize the scriptures, the prophets are. Look at your Bible. I mean, just start looking at it. I mean, scripture, the prophets. That's a lot. But you know what's going to help you greatly understand the scriptures, the prophets? Paul's epistles. It's divine commentary on the scriptures of the prophets. Nothing better than Christ Himself telling you, "Oh, let me tell you what actually was really going on back there." I mean, you compare things that happened back in Exodus in the law, and you compare that with Galatians chapter number 3. You compare uh, the, the promises made to Abraham with Galatians 2, 3, and 4, and all of a sudden you go, oh, this stuff's making a lot of sense now. I see what he's talking about. It's like the, you know, those little yellow books you used to get in school, the little cliff notes. 
spark notes, you know, you get those. You're like, I don't want to read the whole book. I just want to read the cliff notes. Well, the cliff notes are Paul's epistles, but they're very, they're very packed cliff notes. So the benefit of the scriptures of the prophets is the following. We're going to go through just a few verses here. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, verse 6. I appreciate your patience. These are really good. We're round this, round this out here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. When Paul is talking about those um, who were fleeing Egypt with Moses, he says, now these things were written, the stuff with Moses, it was written for what? These things were our example. How do we know about them today? Because they're written down and they're recorded. And that's why we know that they're an example to us. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. What happens when they lust after evil things? Ooh, bad stuff happened to them. Why? That's what sin does. Look at uh, Romans chapter 15. I think there's not a better verse than Romans chapter number 15, verse 4, on the issue of Old Testament and the importance of it today. Romans chapter 15, verse 4, Paul says the following. He says, For whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience... Is it going to take some patience to go through the scriptures of the Old Testament? Yeah, it is. He says, but with your patience and comfort of the scriptures might have what? Might have hope. Because it shows that God's faithful to do as he says he was going to do. You know, in Titus chapter 1 it says, the God who cannot lie promised eternal life before the world began. You want to see a God who cannot lie? Look at the Old Testament. He doesn't lie. That's why when you understand the, the, the dispensation of the grace of God, when people try to wrap it all together and make it all one big program, they're in big trouble. Why is that? Because there's a lot of prophetic elements that haven't been fulfilled. And if only one single prophetic element is not fulfilled, that makes God a liar. And you might as well burn this book. And many people do that. They don't understand what to do, so they say, well, maybe that one God's just not going to fulfill. No, he's going to fulfill every single one of them. Why? Because he said so. And what he says is 100% true. On the issue of uh, one of my other favorite verses is Romans chapter number 4, about Old Testament issues and... and, and uh, and why it was written down. Talking about Abraham here in verse ch- chapter number 4, verse uh, uh, 20. He says, Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, <clears throat> that was God promised to him, he was able to perform. If you actually look through these verses here, verse 19, in the NASB, and I believe in the ESV, it's actually, they say it's not, considering his body not dead, and it's or now dead, it's pretty interesting. It says, he, he says it here, not his own body, now dead. It says not dead, and it's really, it's messed up. It's broken. Uh, but that's what happens. He says in verse number 21, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. He got righteousness by believing, right? And this is what, this is what Paul says. Now, it wasn't written for his sake alone. Well, is, is he dead? Is Abraham dead? Yeah. So was it written for his sake? No, clearly not. He's dead. Not written for his sake alone, but it was also written for who? It's written for us, right? That it was imputed to him, but for us also. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who has delivered our offenses and raised again for our justification. Last verse, look at Ephesians chapter number four. The books of Galatians and Ephesians really mirror each other. There's a lot of uh, information in in both of these that are kind of corollary. But in Ephesians chapter number 4, Paul talks about some similar things like he does in in chapter number 2. He says that you get rooted. What does rooted mean? Is that you think you're established if you're rooted? Yeah, you're rooted. And he says, and built up in him and established in the faith. That's Colossians 2.8, as ye have been taught, abounding there with thanksgiving. And in chapter number 4, he says the following. Remember I said a little bit ago that, you know, you get the gospel, you understand the preaching of Jesus Christ, you're getting it, but do you, do you still need teachers? Yeah, look what Paul says here. He says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. When he's talking about the gifts here, it's pretty funny because he says in verse 10, he says, uh, or verse 8, he says, Wherefore he saith, when he hath ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He conveniently leaves out a couple of the gifts, healing, miracles, tongues, right? He's like, we're going to talk about these gifts. These are the more important ones. He says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And why did he give those? He says, for the perfecting of the saints. That's the building up of them. The establishing them. For the work of the ministry. So they can get out there and do what they need to do. For the edifying of the body. 
that's us in Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith, remember it's a single faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, and unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So then when somebody asks you a question and says, yeah, but you know, what about that verse over in Matthew 5, or Matthew 7, and, you know, whatever they're trying to do, they're trying to get you to, to say something that, well, it sounds like Christ is preaching this. Well, it may sound like that, but let me tell you, let me tell you about Jesus Christ. Let me tell you what he, what he did and what he's done. And you, you can co- you have a complete answer for the person so that you're not sitting there going, oh, I don't know, right? So in chapter 4, he says the following, till we all come to the, full, to, uh, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And here's what happens if you don't. If you don't listen to any of this, you don't want to get the mind, if you at least maybe get the mind gospel issue, which is hopefully the easiest, then these two issues, if you don't, if you don't spend time on them, you don't get through them, this is what's going to happen to you. That henceforth we be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Right? Think about that for a second. Cunning craftiness, lie in wait to deceive. But what do we do here at Suncoast? We speak the truth in love so that they may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, <clears throat> from the whole body, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh the increase of the body out of the edifying of itself, that's other members inside the body of Christ, in love. So God's a power to establish you. He establishes you first through the gospel, which gives us the Holy Spirit which then in turn allows us to understand the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and the scriptures of the prophets. The ultimate end goal is to allow God to establish us. Let him work in you. By doing so and becoming established, you can withstand the wiles of Satan. His goal is to make you dysfunctional, as dysfunctional as he possibly can. Show him who's boss. Let Christ live through you. Let him establish you by his power, with his spirit, with his word. As Paul says, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Let's close in prayer.